Hello and welcome to Bennett's Bike Social. I'm Michael Mann and in this episode of Talking Heads, I'm going to be talking to Kawasaki UK's sales and marketing manager, Craig Watson, about the 2021 Kawasaki range, or specifically the new Ninja ZX-10R, the ZX-10RR, as well as the new ZH2SE. Craig, welcome to Talking Heads. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, nice bit of branding over your shoulder, by the way. Which year is that one? So there's actually a story behind that. That's um, the, uh, the second year. So it was a celebration of the double, if you like. Um, and we presented the actual artwork. That was created by Billy the Artist. I know him, yeah. yeah. I had a conversation with him running up to the final round, and he said, oh, I'd really like to do something for next year. And I said, well, how's about you do a one-off special that, you know, you can't physically buy it and we'll buy all of them, but I want the piece of art as well. And we gifted the actual fine art oil painting to Jonathan at the Irish Road Race Awards in um, Belfast. It was really good. And that's number one of the artist proofs. Oh, good stuff. So that's got a bit of value to it. There's some benefits to having this job. And hopefully uh, Jonathan's got his pride of place above his mantelpiece and not, you know, in the downstairs loo or something. Uh, it's too big. I mean, the, the one that we gifted to him, by the time it was framed, it was literally this size. So. All right, sir, let's move on. All right, so you, we're going to talk about the, well, look, the latest generation of the bike that's been with us since 2004, I think. And it's, of course, it's borne the, the fruits of six world championships in a row, which is uh, rather tremendous. So you've got, for 2021, a new ZX-10R and an RR version. Um, but can you start by just explaining to us uh, maybe the reasons why you've decided to move the, 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 the game on with, uh, with the Ninja? There's a, there's a number of things behind it. I mean, everything obviously evolves. Um, and if you look at the model, um, I suppose, history, the, the last huge change was 2016. The last huge change before that was 2011. And there was sort of evolves, evolvements through it. So every five years, there's a... There's a um, restart button pressed. And what happened from 2016 onwards is a bit that's interesting. So when we brought out the, the 16 bike, there was dramatic geometry changes, dramatic um, engine changes. And then that evolved in 2017 with the launch of an RR, which was under the request of the race team then to give them more space for higher lift cams um, in race spec. And then we got to um, 2019, and because of the World Superbike regulations, there were changes to what you could and couldn't do to the engine. So what we had to do was effectively build more of a World Superbike engine to start with. And that's why we went for, on the 19RR, the red top engine, as we call it, we went for the Pankel lightweight titanium rods. And the characteristic that gave um, on track is a much faster change of direction because you've got less gyroscopic momentum, but also allowed you to break deeper into the corner because again, you've not got an engine pushing you on in the corner and it gave you a faster rev up. So all of the things that people would want out of a race engine, it was there in the homologation special. What we've done now is two sets of things really. A number of changes that make it a better road bike and a number of changes that have been requested by the race team to make it a better race bike. And that's why when we start talking about everything that's beyond the bit that you see, the skin, all of those changes and what they mean to you as a road rider or you as a track rider. What are the differences, what are the main differences between the R and the RR, as in the race bike and the road bike? You've got two, two beasts really. Um, the RR, if you, if you look at what that is, it's everything that we've been requested. Um, and the, the sort of dominant changes are all engine related. So when we brought out the 19 bike, it had lightweight titanium rods to go back to this fast engine spin up, help with change, change of direction, but the team wanted more. So we needed to lower the inertia of the engine. And the next way to gain more performance out of that engine is to go for more performance parts. So we have now got within the RR a full Pankel setup. So that is Pankel titanium rod, Pankel piston, and the, pe the piston, the rod, 
and the pin are all perfectly matched. So it's, it's what you would do building a performance engine. So for instance, when we get those parts from Pankel, who are you know, widely regarded as the sort of world leader in this, this technology, they send us a set um, and they're perfectly matched. Those pistons are another 20 grams individually lighter. So from a standard engine to an RR, you've got give or take half a kilo lighter of reciprocating mass. That sounds really quite small, but when they're bouncing up and down at 14,700 times a minute, it's a huge, huge mass feeling. Um, and what, what that translates to on track is the ability to grab a brake later because the engine's not pushing you on, the ability to change a direction from, for instance, I don't know, like foggy S's at Donington Park, that run through there, you're still carrying quite a bit of rev, and that would make it a slower turning bike if you had a bigger um, reciprocal mass. There are different cams in that engine, um, and they're effectively, given we've got a higher rev limit again, so we're now 14,700 from, I think it was 400 RPM lower last year on the 19 bike. So we've got a very high RPM, and we've now had uh, the, the cam duration and lift are changed to match that. Don't ask me how or what, that's beyond my knowledge. So the, the latest gen road bike, are, are, are road riders going to notice a difference if they rode them back to back? Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, um, I had a 17RR and I moved to a 19RR at the beginning of 2019. And they are like night and day. Um, I'm, I'm very lucky. I usually get the chance to go to Japan to test ride the bikes back to back and... In um, 2018, I flew out to Japan to the test circuit at Autopolis and got the chance to ride 17RR, 19RR, back to back. And the way it feels is it's as though somebody has taken 20 kilos out of the weight of the bike. The bike is the same weight, give or take a penny, but they feel so much lighter. It's literally as... It, you know, people say, oh, can you feel the difference between a full tank and an empty tank? And most people probably can't. It felt like you had two tanks of fuel and no fuel. That was how dramatic it was. So perhaps more about where the weight is? Is it? Is it... It's not even the, where the weight is. It's literally the inertia of an engine spinning. It's the best way to describe it, if you imagine grabbing um, a rod with a uh, mountain bike wheel on it, with a big, thick, muddy mountain bike tyre, spinning it and then trying and doing that and then taking that wheel off and putting i don't know a go-kart wheel um that's that off the sort of thing that you'd see in a red bull race yeah. yeah and spinning it you can do it that really really easy and that's all it is it's gyroscopic mass and spinning that sounds fantastic i mean what the development of these motorcycles going forwards is, is i mean who knows what's going to happen in the next uh, five years or so we're getting even faster yeah. even lighter and whatever um, anyway, so back to the point. Um, yes. All right, so the, 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 the bike was kind of unveiled already, wasn't it, at that, uh, the test last week at Jerez with Jonathan and Alex uh, going out and racing. And of course, you probably forethought uh, or foresaw what everybody was going to be talking about because of that uh, face yourself hashtag. Um, and the face has, well, look, there's no beating around the bushes there. It's caused quite a lot of uh, consternation and comment, hasn't it, by all the uh, experts on social media. Why does it look like it does? Um, it's, 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 I suppose the simple thing is, do you remember when we launched the H2? Um, we launched that at the end of 2014, and that looked like no other motorcycle before it. And we had to explain to people when people said, for instance, why has it only got half a fairing? There was a reason behind that. There was an engineering reason behind it only having half a fairing, and that was to do with heat dissipation. They, were, they asked why it looked like um, it did, and we explained it was relative to aerodynamics. And if you, mentioned, if you remember that bike, it had very small lips um, underneath where you would normally see a headlight. And we explained that small element there was relative to aerodynamics. And on the H2R, on top of those small lips, it had wings. So we know a little bit about aerodynamics. I mean, we build the bullet train. We know how to make something go very, very fast. We build 
um, sections of aeroplanes. We've got a division that their expertise is pure aerodynamics. Across the road at the factory, there is you know, one of the world's best wind tunnels. So this bike's been developed in there. And the look of that bike is the result of the engineering um, byproduct, if you like. So that fr whole front end is a wing. That is our aero package. The way that the screen is, the angle the screen is, the height of the screen, the screen's 40 mil higher on the standard bike over and above the previous model. The fairing is slightly wider. And what it does, those huge, massive, what look like air scoops, they're there literally to act as a wing. But what wasn't immediately obvious in the race bodywork because of the angles they took photos and with it all being jet black, the air is then diverted in through the center, around the outside, where within the side cowling are winglets. So the net result of all of that is 17% greater downforce, but with 7% less drag than the old bike. So we've, we've effectively bolted a wing to the front of the bike, made it create downforce, but make it more slippery so that we're not pushing a brake through the air. So it's 7% less drag. But that's just a little element of the aero pack because the rider's quite important in the aero pack because they're the, the next biggest lump. So the rider position has changed over um, the previous model. So we've put their hands in a different place. We've pushed the bars ever so slightly outwards to get a better flow around their arm. We have changed the shape of the seat. So, you know, if you look at a race bike, nearly always you've got a flat seat and then you've got a little bit of a hump that when they're on a straight, they lift their bum up onto to get a more aerodynamic flow over their back. The standard seat has got that built in effectively because of the angle and the lump at the back. The rear seat cowl has changed. The race team weren't running that seat cowl this week. They only tested the front fairing. Um, so when you see the bike um, uh, in some of the images you'll see now, you'll see that the rear seat unit's changed as well. Albeit subtle, but again, it's to do with airflow. But there's, there's millions of tiny little things. It's like the, the rear reservoir for the brake, um, rear brake, that's moved so that the heel of the rider can go tighter. There's lots of tiny, tiny, tiny little bits that have been done to create a very slippery aero package that creates an awful lot more downforce than the previous model. So effectively, while we've seen those great appendages on the Ducati, uh, even the Hondas are quite subtle, yeah. but they're still very, very evident, even next year's uh, BMW, that, what you're saying is that, that that whole aero package all the way around the front end, from the lights all the way around, that's your version of what they've produced really over the last couple of years? Yes, yeah. Um, they, they've done it one way and we've done it another. Um, if you look at, I suppose if you look at, um, maybe one way to explain it would be to look at a Formula One car. They have a wing right the way across the front. We've now got a wing right the way across the front. They've done, choose, chosen to use it by putting wings down the side. We've chosen to put it across the front of the bike. And how does it work with that ram air effect? Is that, is that I, I see this quite as a sort of a hole through the middle, isn't there? Does that, is that working the same way? Yeah, that's actually, well? that's changed slightly over the, you know, we, we effectively invented ram air. Um, ram air was a, you know, a trademarked um, uh, uh, name of Kawasaki in the same way that jet ski is, if you like. Um, that size has actually got smaller, but because of the aero package the way that it is, it's still as efficient as, as it was on the previous bike. And it's more evident actually on the race fairing than it is on the road fairing because of where the colours are. But there are dividers which separate the twin aero packs, if you like, the two wings. And there's a central piece for your um, air intake to the, um, to the engine. Interestingly, that's one of the things that's also changed um, because of, you know, velocity stacks um, that are within the air box on the RR, they used to sit as 10 mil on the outer and 30 mil on the inner. But because we've pushed for a higher rev limit, they're out all now five mil velocity stacks, which is tuned for high end RPM uh, power. 
And I'll ask the same question as before, really. Are the, uh, is a regular road rider likely to notice the difference with all of these aero changes, rider position changes? Are, do they replicate across the two, across the R and the RR? Yeah, body work on both bikes is identical. So whether you buy the RR and go racing or um, buy the standard bike and ride on the road and do some track days, your aero package is identical. The only difference between the, the, the two um, uh, is the engine and um, wheels. We won Marchesini lightweight wheels um, on, and again, comes back to gyroscopic mass on the RR. You mentioned it earlier on about the influence of the, of the riders, um, presumably that particularly the World Superbike riders, but, uh, but, but do you get feedback from that, the BSB riders, for example, and, and use that too? We get feedback from all, and, and to be honest, one of the sets of feedback that's really important is super stock, because right. super stock is much, much closer to what somebody can buy. Um, and a lot of the geometry changes that are in the standard bike and the RR, they're, um, they're almost null and void for when you go racing if you go super bike, because you can put a different swinging arm on, you can put different triple clamps and headstock and fork offset, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're at super stock class, the swinging arm is a swinging arm and the pivot's where it is. The headstock is the headstock and the headstock's where it is. The fork offset is the fork offset and that's what you've got. So a lot of the chassis changes are relative to real road riders, track day riders and super stock class. So for instance, what we've done on the front of the bike, um, I'm terrible for talking in my hands. Um, what we've done on the front of the bike is we've changed the, the fork offset. It's gone forward two mil. And then at the back, what we've done is we have lengthened the swinging arm by eight mil. So we've got a longer wheelbase of 10 mil. That builds in some natural anti-wheelie because we've given the bike a broader footprint to stand on, if you like. The rear swinging arm pivot has dropped by a mil and we've made some changes to the suspension to match this new setup. So the front fork, the springs have gone from, I think it's a 21 and a half Newton meter spring to a 21, but they've stiffened the compression and rebound factory settings. And on the rear shock, again, longer swinging arm, we've gone to a stiffer rear spring, gone from, I think it's a nine to a nine and a half, um, but we've softened the compression and rebound settings. So it's all about fine tuning. I mean, we've started with a, a really quite good um, uh, uh, base, base package, if you like, and it's evolved and been fine tuned. Yeah, it's certainly been competitive. And presumably all the length of the wheelbase is to get that power down faster, sharper, without worrying too much about getting the, you know, having to, for the rider to, to, to compensate with perhaps a, a thumb brake or a rear brake to get the front end back down again. Yes, and of course having the aero on the front helps it keep down as well because we've now got through fast acceleration, we've now got the front being pushed down. Um, how about the electronics and other componentry? We've talked about suspension already, for example, but uh, is there any change on the, on the 2021 models uh, with, with, with brakes, with biggest, electronics? Yeah, the biggest step is actually the throttle. So the throttle has now um, gone to true fly-by-wire. So previous model had a throttle with a pair of cables that went to a motor that then was um, separated electronically to the throttle bodies. We've now got um, a full electric throttle on the handlebar speaking to the ECU and the ECU controlling the throttle bodies. I mean, we've got a very, very, very advanced um, traction control system that works quite differently to most. Ours is um, what they call predictive traction. So one of the things it does is it monitors rate of change, but it monitors it at a ridiculous rate. So I think it's something like 200 times a second the bike has a look at what's going on and monitors from point A to point B and point A to point B happens 200 times every second. And what it's doing is it's saying, what's the rider doing with the throttle? What is the engine RPM doing? What gear are we in? Because the traction we need in fifth is different to the traction we need in second. Um, what's the front wheel speed doing? What's the rear wheel speed doing? Where are we as far as attitude of the bike? whether that be um, wheelie, pointing downhill, pointing uphill, left, right, and also the, the fifth axis, which is your around the center of the bike, looks at all of those parameters 200 times every second and says, effectively, rather than 
I've made a decision and it throws the information away. I've made a decision, it throws the information away. It keeps the information and it says, you're in second gear, you've asked for 100% throttle, we're at 25 degrees lean angle, and we're now at 11,000 RPM, we're now at 11.2, 11.3. Do you know what? I can see what's about to happen here because it's building a picture and therefore when the traction control kicks in, it kicks in almost before the event rather than after. And if you kick in before rather than after, the interference is less and therefore you get from point A to point B faster. That's the basics of the science behind it all. Predictive traction control. One of the key uh, advantages of having a pure fly-by-wire throttle, it now gives us the opportunity that we can actually have cruise control. And yeah, that's correct, cruise control on a one litre sports bike. But that's not the only, um, I suppose, odd um, uh, feature that you've got on a sports bike. Believe it or not, you can now have heated grips too. Go figure. I think it's tremendous. I think it's great to have the options because those people who do buy them for the road, especially in the UK, I mean, today it was, what, three degrees first thing this morning. I was pleased to have heated grips. You won't get me out there on it. <laughs> Craig, fascinating stuff. Um, thank you for your insights on those particular models. Uh, I, I suppose the, 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 the last question really is surrounding availability and price. So if you're a race team, it's really, really good news because all of those have been airshipped across and um, literally what will be, this is Tuesday now, so yesterday um, the first bike will be on a um, dyno and then getting stripped apart um, and getting turned into the very first race bike in the UK for FS3 Kawasaki. Um, the first batch of those race bikes for British Superbike and Superstock they're landing in end of November, start of December. The standard bike is somewhat behind that. We won't see the standard bike until May. So um, the road going version, which will be 15,799 um, as a retail price will be um, around in May. There'll be a performance edition of it, which will come with Euro 5 um, um, and Acro Acropovix exhaust. I suppose it's worthwhile at this point mentioning that this is the first of the super bikes to come out in Euro 5 trim and meeting all of the new uh, uh, enhanced uh, regulations that we need to hit there. Um, and there's a number of things on the bike relative to that, a different exhaust system, different way of using the catalytic converter. We've moved one of them closer to um, effectively the exhaust port to get it hotter, faster, to make it... Um, um, warm up quicker and therefore be um, more efficient. Um, the bike now runs an oil cooler, um, again something that's been requested via the um, World Superbike teams and Superstock teams. But yeah, um, lots of changes, lots of changes. The performance edition, do you have a price on that one? It's a thousand pounds more, so that will come with a seat cowl. I think it comes off the top of my head, it's a seat cowl, um, it's the Acropovic exhaust. I think you get a uh, screen protector for the TFT screen. The TFT screen can be changed from both uh, like a, a black impression to a white impression, track mode to a road mode. And when you go on a track day, effectively you flick it to track and you're then left with a bigger section for a lap timer, a much bigger gear indicator, and it eradicates the speed so that um, that doesn't be uh, a distraction. <laughs> so that's a thousand pound more, so that's 16,799. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the other version, is that limited? Is that a limited edition? It's, it's, it's 500 worldwide, yeah. Is the race version uh, um, eligible for road use? Yes, yeah, yeah. And Craig, do you have the price on the race version as well? Yeah, so the ZX10RR is 24799. There is a performance edition of it, but if you imagine it already has the seat cowl on as standard because it's a single seat version. Um, the upgrade takes it to 25599 with the Acro. Fantastic. What I think will happen with most people that buy an RR, they'll probably be going all singing, all dancing, buying kit ECU, kit loom, full system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I know that's what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, don't we all? <laughs> So effectively, you're predicting a seventh world championship in a row. 
Never say never. Not, not can you? But, all right, Craig, let's move on. So you've got, there's another model that you're bringing out for 2021, and it is the Z. H2 SE, what are the main differences between that and the, the ZH2 that came out last year? Again, it's all about um, refinement. I'm going to wind it back a little bit of the, the first time I heard we were going to make a naked H2. And it appeared in a, in a business planning document as just a model code. And it was in the naked section. And we have model codes by group. And if it starts with a particular number, you can pretty much figure out what it's going to be. You know, um, and I looked at this model code and I said, that sounds like it's H2. Why is it in the naked section? And they said, ah, oh, um, we've got a plan um, for uh, naked H2. I said, right, so you're going to tune it down then, are you? No, it's going to be 200 horsepower. And so that took a little bit of time to digest and figure out, okay, who's going to buy a 200 horsepower naked um, supercharged bike. And I can remember the first time I rode it. Um, I, I, I got to be honest, I was a little bit nervous um, because it's you know it, it's short, it's compact, it's supercharged, and unlike a, a ZX10 or any other su- sports bike that you get them on song to get them to pull your arms off, a supercharged engine doesn't do that. They they just come on song. Um, and the thing that surprised me was it made you laugh so much but it didn't scare you weirdly admittedly i rode it on the track not on the road um but what a beast of a bike and we we launched that bike um this year out in um las vegas uh, and it was a great launch and we got to ride it um you know on a high speed bowl and therefore got to wind the throttle to the stop in fifth and sixth gear and people were coming in with sort of um slightly pale faces and going, wow, this thing, can, this thing can hustle. But, and there is always a but, you can always improve. We've got a great standard bike, but there are bits that press, there's bits that riders have spoken to us about and said, it's a shame that it didn't such and such. And the natural progression at that point, everybody said to us, why aren't you doing a high spec electronic suspension version? And we obviously knew at that stage it was coming, so we just have to smile and say, that's interesting. Perhaps we can speak to the engineers about that. Mm-hmm. Standard um, answer. You know, fully ready. <laughs> um, so what we've done with that bike, the biggest upgrade was to answer two of those points of improvement request. One was um, high-grade suspension, or higher-grade suspension, and the other was relative to styling, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, the styling was quite subtle on... Um, ZH2, a lot of a lot of black. So the test bike that you rode um, out in Las Vegas with the black and red version, very sort of Sagomi esque, if you like. Um, but the ZH2 SE next year, that that says, have a look at me. It's got enhancements to its color and graphics package. It's got enhancements with um, the belly pan and what have you. But the biggest upgrade, of course, is um, show a suspension that's electronic but it's the new Skyhook suspension. Right. It took a little bit of time for me to um, figure out because my first sort of question was, are we sure this isn't something you send an apprentice to go and get? Skyhook, yeah. <laughs> I had it explained to me um, as, if you imagine suspension, we've been analog for years. And that meant that you got a spanner out to adjust it and it worked in a certain parameter in a certain way. We then went digital with um, going electronic suspension and having an ECU control the damping on the move. What Skyhook does is then goes, you know, full high speed internet, if you like. And the way that it does it is, if you imagine previously, you always looked at what the suspension did with the effect from below. So a force from below under braking or whatever, you then compensated it from above. The best way of describing this that I've had explained to me is the suspension is looking at the bike as something that it's trying to suspend, like on a sky hook, and then it's going to monitor the suspension from below that to hold the bike in a most natural plane. So the way that it does that is through um, a set of uh, sensors. So all of the sensors that the bike has anyway, so throttle position, RPM, 
front wheel speed, rear wheel speed, the gyro of the attitude of the bike. So it's looking at what you're doing and the inputs you're creating. But it then has um, uh, stroke sensors in both the front and rear shock, which monitor the rate of change again, the dive, the release. And what it does, it does all of those. Um, I think it's something like, uh, I think a blink of an eye is something like 300 milliseconds. Yeah. And every, every one millisecond, it monitors what the forks are doing. So in time it takes to blink an eye, it's had a check 300 times. And by all of those ingredients, somebody a lot cleverer than me would be, be able to explain that what that does as far as you as a rider is it makes the, the riding very, very natural, but very, very reactive. Mm -hmm. Imagine you set up the suspension perfect for a dual carriageway run, but then you turn off the dual carriageway and you go through a bumpy roundabout. Your suspension is set for that, not that. Yeah. In the length of the um, sort of slip road, the suspension's checked its monitoring properly probably 15,000 times. So it's constantly evolving and um, adapting and tuning the suspension on the move. It's kind of like having your factory shower technician bolted to the bike. Oh, that's pretty handy. Does that mean that the parameters change depending on which road riding mode you're in? Or does it, is it sort of just a flat system that just works with every, every mode? No, what it does, you do have different modes and the suspension tunes from that relative to the mode that you're in. So you, you can choose, for instance, a road suspension setting, a track suspension setting. You can choose uh, an individual suspension setting um, where you would set the base parameter. So if you imagine what track looks like, it has a baseline, let's say compression and, and rebound damping, and the road might be here. And if you wanted to go individual, you might be able to set it in between the two to suit you. Um, I'm a bit of a believer that there's some engineers out there that perhaps know better than me, so I choose one of their settings. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you can choose the base setting relative to road. Um, and one of the things that's particularly good at is wet riding. Um, it's, there's, a, there's a rain setting that is particularly good. And if you've ever ridden on track in the wet and somebody that knows what they're doing has set your bike for the wet, you can't believe how much grip there actually is mm. with fully set suspension. And it's the same system that appears on the new Versus 1000 as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Same, same, same module doing all of the thinking. Okay. So also on the ZH2 SC, uh, are there any other upgrades or differences between that and the and the ZH2? Mainly, mainly the styling, yeah. So um, the, the two big upgrades are styling and suspension. And then finally, the, the final lump is how fast you can stop. So it's a different front caliper. It's gone to the Stylema caliper from Brembo. Uh, okay, so they've got it from the M4.3. M4s, that's it, yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah. Well done. And you said styling-wise, so it's available in different colours, or is it...? It's just one colour for next year. <laughs> Your traditional black and green, isn't it? Yeah. Black and green and grey, yeah. Okay, well, that's going to look good. Super okay, smart. And have you, got, uh, have you got... Are there any... Really, there's no engine changes, are there? So it's still, it's still I say still, but it's still 200, <laughs> 200 brake horsepower. It is, yes. Yeah. Um, and the pricing has changed. So for the SE model, you're now looking at 18349. Okay. And you'll be pleased to know we'll be doing a performance edition of it with Acro, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that's 19449. Good stuff. So it's 1100 quid more. Um, and are they in dealerships fairly soon? They aren't far away. Um, uh, but as with all of these things, without sounding like a salesman, get in quick because the first shipments are relatively small. Um, first shipments will start to land in showrooms in March. Let me ask you about um, forced induction or, or particularly supercharged production bikes. You are the only mainstream manufacturer who offer them. Are you surprised by that? I mean, obviously the, 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 the range or that particular engine has been around for a few years now and, and, and nobody else has kind of followed suit. Does that surprise you? Yes and no. Um, the reason I say no is it isn't easy. Yeah. We are in every form of automotive, the only manufacturer to do it. Other people have an engine that they bolt a supercharger above it, but nobody has an integrated supercharger. And the reason we can do it is 
through Kawasaki's global strength. You know, we have um, a gas turbine division that builds engines that propel huge, great um, Airbuses and airliners and things. So we know what we're doing with impellers. We know how to match that airflow to throttle connection. And, you know, the very, very first one that came out, we have evolved and improved that connection from then to now. And it's something that we've always been really, really well known for is very, very good fueling. But it isn't easy and you kind of need to be an expert. We're just lucky that at the same place at Akashi, on one side of the road, you've got the motorcycle division. On another part, you've got the aerospace division. And on another part, you've got the gas turbine division. You can get <coughs> all of those people together and create some magic. Do you see forced induction as the as the way to overcome uh, future sort of emission regulations as they get tighter and tighter? Is, is forced induction the way to, 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 to go, do you think? It's one of the ways. We know, for instance, um, as far as fuel economy and how in inverted commas green you are, the H2 engine that's fitted to the H2SX and the ZH2 is what we call balanced supercharger. Mm -hmm. um, if you compared a H2SX with something like a 2017 Z1000SX, one's got 140 horsepower, one's got 200 horsepower, but the 200 horsepower one has got better fuel economy. So yeah, it's very, very good on economy relative to power creation. Is it cleaner too? Yeah, in, in the, if you do that comparison between those two things, yes. I could sit here and ask you about future models, but I know what the answer will be, so I won't. Yeah, the answer will be the line's gone crackly. <laughs> Fantastic, Craig. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a, a, a real uh, eye-opener. Thanks for so much for the detail as well that you've gone into. Um, Sorry, you'll have to stop me next time. I think it's great. I think it's great. And I'm sure that the, I hope that the viewers will uh, agree that um, more detail is better. So, yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for you for joining us as well. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Join us next time. Don't forget to hit subscribe. And if you've got any questions for us or for Kawasaki, I'm sure that Craig will be uh, only too pleased to answer them. Uh, then put them in the, in the comments section below. All right, until next time, thanks again. This is a floppy haired super stock rider. Okay, you can go 50 miles an hour down there. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to just rip him. So you've got this incredible scenery, all these beautiful red rocks and sort of semi mountains. It's all a bit yeah. Jurassic in a way. Yeah, you want to deep fry this, deep fry that, deep fry something else. <laughs> all right. 50. We've got two. We've got the first thing I thought of when I saw it was a basking shark. <laughs>